How many of you here study soil health? Okay, okay that's good. I mean, safe zone. <laughs> I'm not a soil health expert, but it is at UVM. Uh, it is my interactions with uh, uh, colleagues in other departments like plants and soil sciences and so on. Uh, that's what got me into the soil sciences. And combine, I conduct, combine my expertise in nanomaterials and sensors with the my colleagues here at the UVM campus, you know, that, that is what has launched uh, this particular project and my renewed or enhanced interest in soil health one. And I'm going to talk about that um, in this uh, talk. Um, how many of you know that there is something called World Health, a World Soil Day? Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I wasn't aware until this project and since I got interested about it. And um, as you know, this World Soil uh, Day is just this Monday, last Monday. And uh, it is aimed at drawing our attention towards the importance of soil health and also sustainable management of res soil resources and so on. And uh, that's where I, as an engineer with that angle, I want to see how I can help um, protect and improve soil health and how the technology could you know, aid in this particular process. Okay. Um, this is a slide for people who don't know where Vermont and New York is. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be surprised when you travel. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about today. Um, the soil health is inextricably linked to life on earth. Then we will look at back at history in the context of soil health, food scarcity, food security. Then also we will uh, you know, talk about um, the need for enhanced or advanced sensing technologies. And then I will kind of touch upon what are we doing at UVM and uh, what I'm doing with my colleagues here at UVM. Uh, and present some case studies on um, soil and water and how I'm using the sensors to detect certain constituents uh, in these matrices. And then what did we learn from this particular work that we did so far and some challenges that we need to address um, you know, in this area. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank um, Gund Institute for, for Environment for catalyzing the sensor research in, for, in my group. I had done some work in sensors uh, during my postdoc, and then it slowly went into a different direction. But then when I came to UVM, um, then conversations with Deb, Eric Wan, and Carol, uh, Munda, these are the people who uh, triggered or renewed my interest uh, in sensors and, hey, I can do something about the soil aspects that you are studying. And that's where the sensors came into picture. So I have been doing a lot of work in the lab, um, uh, making the sensors, but then I met uh, Tian Xia, you know, my colleague just next to uh, you know, you know, the top floor in Sam's building. And he, is, he has been working on developing uh, drones and communication systems for field scale applications. I do lab scale, he does field scale. So there's a very nice synergy here. And we started collaborating and now it has taken off um, you know, in the past few months in a huge way. Um, and also, um, I want to thank, um, you know, the Agency of Agriculture and Vermont Space Grand Consortium um, that supported this particular work. And there are several other proposals, all in sensors that are currently under review. There's a lot of exciting things happening uh, in this area. I only talk in my office, in my lab, but they are the ones who actually <laughs> did all the work. I just talk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Bob, um, the first one there, um, he's the one who did the majority of the work and I'm going to talk some of his findings and there are a bunch of undergrads work on this supported by Gund Institute and other agencies. They're all, you know, they are my disciples. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's look at this. It is soil health is um, inextricably linked to life on earth. Um, a summary report from uh, a nature conserv conservancy uh, group. Um, they did a lot of soil health uh, literature review and then they put out this document, Rethink Soil, a Roadmap for US Soil Health. They found this, uh, 44 billion pounds of nutrients are getting lost into the environment annually. 48.4 million acre feet of water is being used for irrigation annually. 
346 million metric tons of greenhouse gases are getting emitted from soils into the atmosphere. 996 million metric tons of soil is getting washed off, eroded, the agricultural and, and so on. It's a huge, huge problem. I highlighted these two in red, uh, which I'm going to talk about how I'm studying these two aspects and using sensors and so on. I'll come to that a little later. Let's look at history. Okay. World War II, it has been a scar upon human race forever. It has taken 40 to 50 million lives. <coughs> this is not a blame game. You know, it's, um, it, it happened and this is what as human beings we are doing. Even today, it's happening as we speak, right? The wars are happening. Unfortunately, that's what we do. Soil degradation is a serious concern. We don't realize it, not many people. It is emerging and it's there. And this map shows the regions where soil is getting deteriorated. The patches in red are already in a serious concern state. The patches in orange, they are getting there. You can see how they are almost most of the globe is under threat. Um, what we are looking here, it's not going to come from wars or bombings and so there's no bang bang happening here. Unfortunately, this these kind of things happen very silently, very quietly. We don't even realize this is happening right under our feet. Okay. Um, every scientist um, is saying that by 2045, we will be producing 40% less food on the planet. And we will have 9.2 billion people by 2045. And if that happens, then, you know, the, and if the things go as they are right now, the World War II will look like a small blink because if 40% less food means, it is estimated in six months about 1.5 to 1.7 billion people can die in six months time. Imagine that, such a important issue. Agriculture is the keystone for any civilization. You know that. The whole civilization has been built only because of the hunger, the fire of the belly, right? The same fire can burn civilizations down if it's not quenched. So we should not underestimate the soil health and the agricultural aspect. Food security, or food scarcity can lead to conflicts. Since 1990s, there have been 30 wars in Africa, 27 of them are for sake of acquiring fertile soil. Food scarcity is in France. They are the main trigger for the French Revolution, food. The Russian Revolution in 1917, that's also for food. Their slogan, peace, land, and bread. That's their slogan, food again. And the Cultural Revolution in China, that was also triggered by the repeated famine, famines in the country. So once there is no food on the street, it's easy to, you know, um, fuse the light. Um, and if you want peace, everybody must have food. There is no peace, there is no food. So it is as simple as that. It's very, very important that we pay attention to the soil health. Again, you, know, um, you all know this, agriculture is the main source for food grains and we are widely used for many raw materials that we use every day. It's also key driving force of economic transformation and growth. And also it's important, it can help to reduce poverty and achieving food security. Currently, there are over 900 million people that are undernourished. And by 2045, we will be needing more food, 55% 55, 55 more food is needed. So where are we going to get that? Population today is 8 billion people. We will be getting there. More demand, more people means more demand for food. So this is where I think, um, enhanced or smart technologies could potentially help in tackling soil health and food security challenges. So the, these technologies could increase agricultural productivity and reduce food losses to guarantee food security. And precision agriculture, it, you know, we can use this uh, approach to use less to grow more uh, compared to traditional agricultural practices. And then we can use the technology to reduce the environmental impacts, improve the quality of work, environmental and social aspects of farming, ranching, and other professions. Again, when it, the precision agriculture, like there are so many facets to it. And uh, my, my focus is on sensors and through collaborations, I would like to explore this uh, uh, precision agriculture and its relevance to soil health and so on. I've been working with uh, many folks on campus uh, in this area. 
this is an opportunity here. We have an opportunity here where there's a lot of expertise on EVM campus, um, you know, in our hyper spectral lab, people are doing lots of different things. Um, so I think we can, now we got this big uh, NOVA grant, which we can leverage to really consolidate uh, all the expertise on campus and develop this low cost sensing network systems for monitoring water quality and soil health and so on. So we can utilize various uh, elements here, like um, mobile sensing, low cost wireless sensors, that's my area, and also fixed locations, uh, continuous sensors we have with the EPSCO, and Shroth and all, they're all working on this. Now we can use this kind of funding to you know, establish um, this sensing network systems. With this in place, we will be able to collect and evaluate critical data for decision making, management, and especially when crop growth conditions kind of vary over space and time. Okay. So I believe these low cost sensors, because low cost, like really cheap compared to the conventional or commercial sensors, they could play a really uh, critical role in soil health monitoring. If you look at it, um, the soil is typically has 25% water, 45% minerals, 25% air, and 5% organic matter. And the sensors that we are developing are for those red, uh, the ones that are highlighted in red, nutrients, uh, pH, moisture, pollution, temperature, and so on. Maybe in the near future, plant wearables and insect pest detection and so on. My group's focus is electrochemical sensors and radio frequency sensors. We are working. Uh, we are developing these electrochemical sensors um, uh, and radio frequency sensors here. We are collaborating with South Dakota University to develop some coatings that can protect these sensors in harsh environments and so on. But these are the things that are getting developed right now um, in my lab. So in this talk, I'm going to mainly focus on electrochemical methods. And um, it's a very simple, it's an electric electrode system has a counter electrode, a working electrode and a reference electrode. Then we put, an ion selective membrane on it. Uh, this is the you know, a medium that allows the chemical energy to transfer to electrodes and gets converted to electrical energy. On this ion selective membrane, we put a, something called molecular receptors. They are very selective and specific to the constituent that we want to detect and quantify in the soil or water and so on. So those are the, one of the key agents that we need in place. So when this sensor is exposed to the solutions uh, with constituents in it, they will go and bind, when they bind, they will uh, produce a change in potential, which that can, which can be uh, measured by using a potential stat and then can be quantified and correlated to the concentration of the species. So we, we have already developed sensors for these four different constituents, um, ammonium, nitrate, calcium, and uh, ions. These sensors have only these six um, ingredients. Ionophore, that's one of the main ingredients that is uh, involved in detecting uh, specific constituents. Plasticizer, cation exchanger, uh, PVC material. And the other important element that we found was the carbon nanotubes. These are um, carbon nanotubes. They are the uh, highly electrically conductive property they have. That's what allows the signal transfer from the chemical reaction to the electrode surface. And we found that adding these nanotubes allowed or enhanced the sensitivity of these uh, sensors and also uh, allowed the sensors to perform much longer periods. I'm going to show a little bit of data associated with it. After we got the gun um, funding, we put um, Robert uh, to work. Um, and initially, we've been manually making the sensors like a drop by drop. We call this a drop casting method. We make a cocktail of those things and deposit onto the electrode surface and then we'll allow them to dry and form a thin film. Here, it's once you get the cocktail in place, it's more of an art to get a very homogeneous thin film. It's day and night, <laughs> these guys work to get that um, films working and perfectly and so on. This is the uh, scanning electron microscopy view of the sensor surface. Um, this dark patch is the ion selective membrane with the receptors on it. And the cross section of it is, this is the membrane. That's the sensing element on the sensor surface. It's about 40 microns in, uh, in thickness. Uh, we also did uh, uh, EDS, uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy to understand the elemental composition and the distribution of ionophores and other things in the, uh, on the sensor surface. These yellow charts are showing the presence of oxygen atom on the sensor surface. 
and uh, you can see the distribution of these yellow dots. Oc presence of oxygen atom implies the presence of specific ionophore. Okay? And chloride implies presence of PVC on that uh, membrane element. When we added nanotubes to it, you can see how these yellow dots light it up. See, and the green dots kind of you know, um, went down. So the same, these nanotubes, these are electrically conductive. They are now not only electrically conductive, they are serving as a surface for the ionophores to be absorbed and stay available on the surface for binding and so on. So this is this is what I think you know, enhance the sensitivity of the sensors and also improve the detection. The, we, those are the two commercially available ionophores that we used in this sensing uh, work. Uh, that's an ion, ammonium ionophore, very selective for ammonium ions, and that's a nitrate ionophore selected for um, nitrate ions. Again, this is the sensor ar architecture for, this is how our microsensor looks like, ammonium and nitrate. This is the working electrode uh, with the various components like ionophore, multi quad carbon nanotubes, and PVC layer sitting on the cold. Gold electrode and the, when the reactions happen, potential changes. So the plot on the left is showing the how the nanotubes, presence of nanotubes affected the measurements. In the absence of nanotubes, sensors still worked, but there was a signal drift over a 150 hour operation. The signal was drifting, we have to keep on correcting for that drift. But when we added the nanotubes, the drift was very small, very slow, it remained very stable for that 150 hour period. That's really um, exciting for us. Um, otherwise we have to develop some equations to correct and do all that. It can be done, but this is better. <laughs> uh, then, okay, I, I was talking about gold electrode, but how do you know that is the, the material for the sensing, right? So we looked at three different materials like carbon, gold, and graphene to see if, which one, if there is something better than gold. Um, then, um, we took ammonium ions and uh, measured their concentrations from one milligram to 8,000 8, 8, milligrams or something like that in that concentration range. Um, oh, sorry, one milligram to 250 milligrams um, in that concentration range. And the, the graphs here, the orange lines are for gold, blue is carbon, and the gray is graphene. Both are same plots. One is in the linear form. You can see the R square values, um, gold and carbon, uh, carbon and gold, they perform relatively little, little bit better than the graphene, uh, but they all give um, linear plots. Then we looked at the um, calcium. Oh, sorry about the typo. It should be calcium ions on the x-axis, potential and y-axis. Uh, again, carbon, gold, and graphene. Uh, in here, uh, graphene um, performed better uh, when it comes to uh, calcium ion sensing followed by um, carbon and gold, they're almost similar, but uh, they're, they're looking at the Oscar values, they're all did pretty well, carbon, gold, and uh, graphene. So it doesn't matter for calcium, but for ammonium, gold and carbon, they are better. So after doing this, you now we have established this, these guys can sense uh, the, uh, the uh, ammonium and nitrate ions. Now we want to know how the temperature affects their sensitivity. So we looked at 15 to 30 degrees Celsius, and then the plot there um, showing the theoretical concentration versus the actual measurements. The dots are actual measurements, and the line is the predictions um, using a model, NERST equation. Um, you can, at 15 degrees, there is not a good trace of the model with respect to the experimental measurements. 20 and 25, 30, it's pretty good for ammonium ion with carbon as a substrate. Okay. At 15 degrees, there is a deviation. Then ammonium ion with gold substrate, they are much better um, you know, over the temperature range. So now calcium on the carbon substrate, it, it did not perform very well um, uh, at, in, in that temperature range. Uh, calcium, but on gold sensor, it performed very well. So the gold, at least in the, for these two particular species, gold seems to be... Um, a little more insensitive to temperature effects. So we chose that gold substrate and developed these sensors for now okay, for detecting ammonium ions. And uh, we did a, and we measured a wide range of concentrations and each line there uh, corresponds to one, uh, 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 the three lines correspond to three different sensors. 
So they are highly reproducible and we were able to get a consistent reading for each measurement. Um, again, these are the calibration curves associated with it. Then calcium, again, uh, uh, this is the, uh, you know, we, we measured 0.1 to 1 molar and we were able to get some consistent readings. And this is the calibration curve for that. So with gold, they are gold and uh, gold electrode, we were able to uh, detect ammonium ions and calcium ions very well you know, using these sensors. So now we have uh, established that, you know, we developed these working sensors. Now we want to apply and see if we can measure uh, certain processes in the soil and its constituents of the soil and so on. So we, we, are, look, we are looking at two different uh, matrices. One is a wet soil and the second one is lake, lake water. So soil, coming back to soil, I showed the four items that Nature Conservancy Group looked at, so like soil erosion and the constituents of the soil, like nutrients, like water, and calcium, for example. So this is the picture that I got from the web, uh, showing a windblown soil rising from a farm field near Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. Soil is very tight. There's no natural organic matter holding it together. There's no microbes or anything. You know, it's deteriorated soil. When wind is blowing, you know, it, can, you know, it blows away, and soil is degrading. So can we, can we mitigate the soil erosion? Can we sense the constituents in the soil using the sensors and so on? So again, soil erosion, there's an approach to that and then use sensors to measure these constituents. So how are we mitigating the soil erosion? So we picked up this um, microbially in induced calcite precipitation where we can use microbes uh, in the presence of uh, uh, certain uh, substrates like urea and uh, uh, calcium bicarbonate, these guys, uh, can um, you know um, create certain reactions like urea hydrolysis, the photosynthesis, and sulfide, and you, uh, the result of those reactions is it precipitates calcite into the soil. And the calcite would help hold these uh, you know uh, materials together soil. So this these reactions are done by urolytic bacteria. They are naturally present in every soil. Um, uh, uh, so they are if we can harness them and use them in a certain way, we can they can help us to prevent or uh, mitigate soil erosion. And we, we chose this uh, Sporosarcina pasteurai. This is very commonly used uh, bacterium for uh, MICP studies. And it's also very common in many soils. So we chose that bacterium. And then when we put this bacterium um, and add some urea to the soil, uh, then uh, the bacteria produce urease and uh, oxidizes the urea and produces ammonium ions. And then if you have calcium bicarbonate in the water, in the soil pore water, uh, they, and, uh, they react and the end result is it precipitates calcite, calcium carbonate into, into that soil matrix. For you to visualize these reactions, you can imagine the bacterium that's there. And when this MICP is going on, the calcite starts to precipitate um, into so on and around the bacteria. And if you have soil, two soil particles, the bacteria colonizes the surface. And when you have these right conditions, the you know, when the MICP reaction happens, the calcite precipitates. And that calcite precipitates in between the soil particles and forms a bridge and it holds the particles together. Okay. And then it can spread to the whole soil matrix. So we need to, you know, we can we can engineer the process to get to that level. Um, and in the field scale, we can imagine that you have, you can, if there is that kind of a dry soil, we can create these engineered solutions where you can inject um, hard water and calcium bicarbonate solutions and the bacterial solution, and then you can initiate these MICP-like reactions. For example, you have you know, uh, pH will change, calcium will change, and ammonium ions will change. As the reaction happens, then the calcium will go down because it's precipitating out of solution. pH goes down, you become more and more alkaline and more ammonium ion gets produced. And we did this uh, batch test in the reactor. We looked at two different soil types, glass beads and F silica sand. Untreated soil, they are F75 soil. They look like very loose particles. And then when you do, when we did this MICP reaction, and was able to hold it. We have done, uh, Bob has done um, two chapters of dissertation work on understanding the soil properties and geotechnical properties of these materials and all. And I was focusing on just to understand these bio biological processes and the constituents that are forming and so on. <coughs> that's where the sensors came into picture. Again, in the lab test, like you can see a sensor dipped into MICP solution. And when we did that reaction, at the end of the reaction, the huge amount of calcite 
precipitated into the beaker because of this MICP. How do we know it's a calcite? We did the XRD analysis on it and looked under the microscope and it's confirmed that whatever is precipitating out was calcite. Um, we also measured um, the concentrations of ammonium ion, calcium and calcium carbonate content uh, after the reactions. And we use sensors to monitor the changes in concentration of ammonium ions and calcium ions. Remember, calcium is going, it's precipitating out of solution. It is dissolved in initially and precipitates calcium, so it should disappear. The concentration of calcium should go down and ammonium ion due to the reaction should increase in salt. But it's just the opposite happening. That's not what we are expecting to see in the soil. This is what we are expecting to see. Yes, expecting to ammonia to increase and calcium to go down. Why this happened? That's why. The calcite that produced, it's not only precipitated in the soil, but also precipitated on the sensors. It's fouled by sensors. <laughs> Look at the intensity of that fouling, you know, so much. Uh, you know, this is the like clean sensor. And then the sensor surface under the microscope. The, whole thing got covered. And there are like pores where some things can go and get detected still. That's why we're still seeing the signal, but fouling. If you have dynamic reactions happening and if you put a sensor on top of it in there, it's going to uh, mess up the sensor unless you have some anti-fouling strategy in place, okay? Again, um, so uh, they sensors as they are, they put it, they experience significant fouling and the presence of bacteria and calcium ions. Again, we have to be careful. If there are a lot of dynamic reactions happening, we have to make sure the sensor can resist those reactions and uh, help us monitor whatever we are monitoring. Okay. So, but from the soil erosion perspective, this MICP worked really well. We are able to you know, bind breach particles using those reactions. And I think there's a lot of potential there to a green solution to mitigate soil erosion and it needed we can use sensors to model, monitor the movement of these nitrates, ammonium, uh, calcium ions in soil matrices. I'm going to switch gears into what are we doing in terms of field scale monitoring. Um, so here, uh, the, our vision or the, the goal is to develop sensors, um, take the lab scale sensors and deploy them in the on the farm or deploy them in the lake, for example, and create these certain uh, sensor boxes and, uh, and send the drone that can fly over them and gather data um, um, uh, you know, uh, and send it back to us. Um, this field scale research, this is where uh, my colleague uh, Tian Chia is an EBE who is helping us and we are collaborating to you know, integrate my sensors with his drone um, systems. Uh, his students have already had a prototype drone um, 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 uh, in place, and they have successfully demonstrated, uh, sent a drone over the lake and collected uh, conductivity information you know, along the path. So we can use these kind of systems to um, monitor, gather information about certain constituents in the water. So this is the demonstration of their work. <laughs> So next semester, my, my census was going to be you know, embedded into that drone, hopefully you know, <laughs> collect more data. So what did we learn? Right, in this, um, so these are in aqueous solutions, these sensors are perfect. We are able to detect um, the constituents, but fouling uh, is an issue that we need to take care of. But the sense we have a working sensors for ammonium, nitrate, pH, um, calcium, and so on. And the electron material matters. Like any, any material, you know, it's not going to uh, work. We have to be sensitive about the environmental conditions like temperature, pH, and all that. And then accordingly, we have to choose the right um, electrode material uh, that remains um, uh, or doesn't react to the interferences that might affect the 
potential measurements and so on. MICP, I think there's a potential here that can help us to mitigate soil erosion and thereby mitigate um, you know, soil erodibility by forming these calcite bridges between soil particles and so on. This could be a potentially environmental friendly solution to mitigate um, soil erosion and protect soil health. So low cost sensing, if this has to become um, a reality, then anti-falling strategies and the receptors. The, the two receptors are there to be highly selective and sensitive to the, you know, to the species that we want to detect. And we need to have this anti-falling strategy to protect these sensors in harsh environments. In my opinion, like based on what I experienced in these past three years, I think these are the four things that we need to focus on if we want to make take these low cost sensor uh, systems into, you know, into a reality. Um, like one is we have to improve the sensing performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity and reliability for key soil health parameters. It could be dissolved species or gases uh, and also with little interfer interference from background noise. Also develop, develop a sufficient low power consumption wireless sensing networks with powerful data processing and long range wireless communication. I think that, that is going to uh, help us gather more data in the field scale. Um, and develop versatile sensing platforms that can be distributed in large scale to collect real time uh, soil monitoring, um, soil data, um, and also develop self powered or power independent sensors and sensing platforms that are low cost and reliable and maintenance free. I think these are the things that we need to work on in the future if we want to realize these kind of uh, systems. And with that, I will open it to questions. Yeah.